Located near Geneva, Switzerland, the LHC is an engineering marvel. It serves as a modern temple of science where leading physicists convene to explore the mysteries of the universe. And most recently, in a groundbreaking revelation, podcast host Joe Rogan disclosed that something evil just happened at CERN that no one can explain. What exactly happened? What could this affect us? Join us as we delve into a startling finding at CERN that has left scientists baffled. First and foremost, remember that one of the most ambitious goals of the LHC at CERN is to recreate conditions similar to those that existed immediately after the Big Bang. To understand how the LHC can attempt to recreate the Big Bang, it's crucial to delve into the science of particle physics, the nature of the Big Bang itself, and the technology behind the LHC. Big Bang theory imagines a series of epochs, each with a characteristic energy and temperature. However, not all of these epochs are well understood. For instance, the earliest moments of the universe remain elusive. They are shrouded in mystery, and our understanding is merely a series of educated guesses. However, in a fraction of a second, the conditions of the early universe quickly transitioned to ones that are testable by modern technology. CERN's LHC, which is the world's most powerful particle accelerator in operation, accelerates pairs of protons to nearly the speed of light and slams them head-on into one another. The proton's motion energy is converted into heat energy that reaches temperatures 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun, temperatures that were last common in the universe less than one trillionth of a second after the universe began. Other experiments have studied the behavior of matter when the expansion of the universe cooled enough such that the laws of particle physics no longer applied and the era of nuclear physics commenced. By the time the universe was just a few minutes old, the makeup of the universe and the laws that govern it were already locked in place. Three minutes after the universe began, the nuclei of the primordial hydrogen and helium that made up the first stars already existed, though it would take hundreds of thousands of years before the universe cooled enough to make atomic hydrogen and helium. After the formation of atoms, gravitational forces dominated for hundreds of millions of years, leading to the creation of the first stars, a point at which nuclear physics once again played a crucial role. So which epochs of the early universe do particle accelerators study? Let's begin the story during an epoch for which the story is not yet fully understood. At the very early time of about 10 to the power of negative 36 to 10 to the power of negative 32 seconds after the universe began, Cosmologists believe that the universe experienced a period of expansion at speeds that exceeded the speed of light. This is called the inflation epoch. There is a lot of circumstantial evidence that this occurred, but there is no definitive confirmation that inflation actually occurred. As of this video, inflation remains a theoretical proposition. At the end of inflation, the universe was hot and dense and quite different from the universe of today. The universe was far too hot for atoms to exist. The same was true for protons, neutrons, and quarks, which are the particles found inside protons and neutrons. Even mass and electric charge are thought to have not existed. So, the entire universe was full of highly energetic and massless particles. Scientists are not entirely sure what happened in the universe before about 10 to the power of negative 13 seconds. One reason is that we lack the technology to concentrate enough energy to study those early times. However, the LHC allows them to collide together pairs of protons traveling at nearly the speed of light. The maximum energy generated in one of those collisions will generate temperatures last common in the universe 10 to the power of negative 13. With that capability, our understanding of the evolution of the universe improves dramatically. At about 10 to the power of negative 12 seconds, 
an energy field called the Higgs field came into existence. This field interacted with the matter in the universe and gave particles their mass. At the same time, electric charge came into being. Instead of a universe in which only massless energy existed, particles with mass came into being. These particles were called quarks and leptons. Today, quarks are found only inside protons and neutrons, and the most familiar lepton is called the electron. The Higgs boson, which is a vibration of the Higgs field, was discovered in 2012. However, in that early time, quarks were not restricted to exist in protons and neutrons. Quarks could roam freely. After all, the universe was too hot for protons and neutrons to exist. If you placed a proton in that early universe, it would effectively melt and let its constituent quarks run freely, much like if you put an ice cube on a hot sidewalk where the heat melts the ice and water can move around. Time progressed and the universe expanded and further cooled. By about one millionth of a second, or 10 to the power of negative six second, the universe cooled enough that quarks could no longer wander freely. Strong forces gathered the quarks together, forming protons and neutrons. Electrons existed, as did an unfamiliar particle called a neutrino. Neutrinos are very low-mass subatomic particles that interact very weakly with matter. In the modern day, they are generated in nuclear reactions, and they don't have much effect on the universe. However, the density of the universe at 10 to the power of negative 6 seconds was so high that neutrinos interacted fairly strongly with the protons, neutrons, and electrons that dominated the universe. By the time the universe was about one second old, the density of the universe dropped enough that neutrinos no longer interacted with other forms of matter. Indeed, our current universe is full of neutrinos that last interacted with matter a scant second after the universe began. Very sensitive experiments are underway, which should be able to detect these primordial cosmic neutrinos. Over the next several minutes, the expansion of the universe continued to cool to low enough temperatures that protons and neutrons could begin to clump together to form atomic nuclei. Had the density of the universe stayed high, the nuclei of all of the known elements could have formed. However, the rapid drop in the density of the universe only allowed for the simplest nuclei to form. By about three minutes after the universe began, hydrogen nuclei and helium nuclei had formed along with rare isotopes of hydrogen. By three minutes, the universe consisted of about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. That's by mass ratio. If you simply counted hydrogen and helium nuclei, the ratio was about 92% hydrogen and 8% helium. The difference is because helium nuclei weigh four times as much as hydrogen. There were also trace amounts of other substances, but for the most part, all other elements would not come into existence until they were formed in the center of stars. So, this is the story of how particle accelerators teach us about the early universe. At much later times, about 380,000 years after the universe began, the universe cooled enough for those hydrogen and helium nuclei to capture electrons and the first atoms came into existence. And the story was certainly not complete as gravity eventually gathered those atoms into hot clumps that eventually became stars and galaxies. Our understanding of the nature of the universe from the very beginning to just a couple minutes after it began is quite sophisticated and guided by firm measurements. More importantly, our understanding is not from theoretical speculation but rather from complex and detailed measurements. Using giant atom smashers, scientists can literally recreate the conditions of the early universe and see how things work. The drive to understand how our universe began is an ancient one, with the first stories found in some of humanity's earliest writings. Through a combination of astronomical observation and experiments performed inside enormous particle accelerators, scientists are beginning to have a very clear understanding of how it all began. 
While the LHC has made remarkable contributions to our understanding of physics, its operation has sparked concerns about potential dangers. These concerns, though often dismissed by the scientific community, warrant careful examination. First of all, remember that the thing that poses the most danger to us is whatever's up there at the highest energy per particle collision that we get. On Earth, that record is held by the Large Hadron Collider, where the overwhelming majority of proton-proton collisions actually result in the gluons inside each proton colliding. When they smash together because the proton's total energy is split among its constituent particles, only a fraction of the total energy belongs to each gluon. So it takes a large number of collisions to find one where a large portion of that energy, say 50% or more, belongs to the relevant colliding gluons. When that occurs, however, that's when the most energy is available to either create new particles via E equals mc squared or to perform other actions that energy can perform. One of the ways we measure energies in physics is in terms of electron volts, or the amount of energy required to raise an electron at rest to an electric potential of one volt in relation to its surrounding. At the Large Hadron Collider, the current record holder for laboratory energies on Earth the most energetic particle-particle collision possible is 14 TeV, or 14,000,000,000 electron volts. There are things we can worry will happen at these highest of energies, each with their own potential consequence for either Earth or even for the universe as a whole. A non-exhaustive list includes, if we reach high enough energies and there are certain types of extra dimensions, it may be possible to create minuscule black holes. Theoretically, they should decay via Hawking radiation on incredibly short timescales, shorter than the Planck time without extra dimensions, but potentially long enough for them to physically exist with them. If the matter-antimatter asymmetry arose due to a breaking of a certain cosmic symmetry at a higher energy, then restoring the symmetry could lead to that symmetry re-breaking in a different fashion. Rather than having matter win out over antimatter at about the one part in one billion level, it could lose instead, or either win or lose by a different amount entirely. If the cosmic inflation that occurred prior to the Big Bang arose because certain high energy conditions were met, then recreating those conditions could cause a restoration of the inflationary state. This would lead to the rapid, exponential expansion of space wherever it occurred, pushing our universe away from it and leading to a new inflationary state. Or, given that the zero-point energy of empty space appears to be non-zero, as evidenced by the existence of dark energy, it's possible that raising the universe to high enough energies could kick the energy of empty space out of this state and possibly send it into another lower energy state. This would create the same conditions as a vacuum decay catastrophe, which would create a bubble of destruction that destroyed all matter within it that expanded outward at the speed of light. Although these scenarios are all bad in some sense, some are worse than others. The creation of a tiny black hole would lead to its immediate decay if you didn't want it to decay, you'd have to impose some sort of new symmetry to prevent its decay, and even then, you'd just have a tiny mass black hole that behaved similarly to a new, massive, uncharged particle. The worst it could do is begin absorbing the matter particles it collided with, and then sink to the center of whatever gravitational object it was a part of. Even if you made it on Earth, it would take trillions of years to absorb enough matter to rise to a mass of one kilos. It's not threatening at all. The restoration of whatever symmetry was in place before the universe's matter-antimatter symmetry arose is also interesting, because it could lead to the destruction of matter and the creation of antimatter in its place. As we all know, matter and antimatter annihilate upon contact which creates bad news 
for any matter that exists close to this point. However, fortunately, the absolute energy of any particle-particle collision is tiny, corresponding to tiny fractions of a microgram in terms of mass. Even if we created a net amount antimatter from such a collision, it would only be capable of destroying a small amount of matter, and the universe would be fine overall. But if we instead were able to recreate the conditions under which inflation occurred, things would be far worse. If it happened out in space somewhere, we'd create, in just a tiny fraction of a second, the greatest cosmic void we could imagine. Whereas today, there's only a tiny amount of energy inherent to the fabric of empty space, something on the order of the rest mass energy of only a few protons per cubic meter. During inflation, it was more like a Google protons per cubic meter. If we could achieve those same energy densities anywhere in space, they could potentially restore the inflationary state, and that would lead to the same universe-emptying exponential expansion that occurred more than 13.8 billion years ago. It wouldn't destroy anything in our universe, but it would lead to an exponential, rapid, relentless expansion of space in the region where those conditions occur again. That expansion would push the space that our universe occupies outward in all three dimensions as it expands, creating a large cosmic bubble of emptiness that would lead to unmistakable signatures that such an event had occurred. It clearly has not, at least not yet, but in theory, this is possible. And finally, the universe today exists in a state where the quantum vacuum, the zero-point energy of empty space, is non-zero. This is inextricably, although we don't know how to perform the calculation that underlies it, linked to the fundamental physical fields and couplings and interactions that govern our universe. The physical laws of nature. At some level, the quantum fluctuations in those fields that cannot be extricated from space itself, including the fields that govern all of the fundamental forces, dictate what the energy of empty space itself is. But it's possible that this isn't the only configuration for the quantum vacuum. It's plausible that other energy states exist. Whether they're higher or lower doesn't matter. Whether our vacuum state is the lowest possible one or whether another is lower doesn't matter either. What matters is whether there are any other minima, any other stable configurations, that the universe could possibly exist in. If there are, then reaching high enough energies could kick the vacuum state in a particular region of space into a different configuration, where we'd then have at least one of different laws of physics, a different set of quantum interactions, or a different set of fundamental constants. Any of these would, if it was a more stable configuration than the one that our universe currently occupies, cause that new vacuum state to expand at the speed of light, destroying all of the bound states in its path down to atomic nuclei themselves. Over time, this catastrophe would destroy billions of light years worth of cosmic structure. If it happened within about 18 billion light years of Earth, that would eventually include us, too. There are tremendous uncertainties connected to these events. Quantum black holes could be just out of reach of our current energy frontier. It's possible that the matter-antimatter asymmetry was only generated during the electro-weak symmetry breaking, potentially putting it within current collider reach. Inflation must have occurred at higher energies than we've ever reached, as do the processes that determine the quantum vacuum but we don't know how low those energies could have been. We only know from observations that such an event hasn't yet happened within our observable universe. But despite all of this, we don't have to worry about any of our particle accelerators, past, present, or even into the far future, causing any of these catastrophes here on Earth. The reason is simple. The universe itself is filled with natural particle accelerators that are far, far more powerful than anything we've ever built or even proposed here on Earth. From collapsed stellar objects that spin rapidly, such as white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes, very strong electric and magnetic fields can be generated by charged, 
moving matter under extreme conditions. It's suspected that these are the sources of the highest energy particles we've ever seen. The ultra-high energy cosmic rays, which have been observed to achieve energies many millions of times greater than any accelerator on Earth ever has. Whereas we've reached up above the 10 TeV threshold for accelerators on Earth, or 10 to the power of 13 EV in scientific notation, the universe routinely creates cosmic rays that rise up above the 10 to the power of 20 EV threshold. With the record set more than 30 years ago by an event known appropriately as the Oh My God particle. Even though the highest energy cosmic rays are thought to be heavy atomic nuclei, like iron rather than individual protons, that still means that when two of them collide with one another, a near certainty within our universe given the vastness of space, the fact that galaxies were closer together in the past, and the long lifetime of the universe, there are many events producing center of mass collision energies in excess of 10 to the power of 18, or even 10 to the power of 19 EV. None of them have ever restored the inflationary potential. None of them have ever caused the universe to transition into a more stable vacuum state. And none of them have ever changed the laws or constants of physics in a way that has persisted to the present day. This tells us that any catastrophic, cosmic effect that we could worry about is already tightly constrained by the physics of what has happened over the cosmic history of the universe up until the present day. None of the cosmic catastrophes that we can imagine have occurred, and that means two things. The first thing is that we can place likely lower limits on where certain various cosmic transitions occurred. The inflationary state hasn't been restored anywhere in our universe, and that places a lower limit on the energy scale of inflation of no less than nada to the power of 19 mbisti. This is about a factor of 100,000 lower, perhaps, than where we anticipate inflation occurred, a reassuring consistency. It also teaches us that it's very hard to kick the zero-point energy of the universe into a different configuration, giving us confidence in the stability of the quantum vacuum and disfavoring the vacuum decay catastrophe scenario. But it also means we can continue to explore the universe with confidence in our safety based on how safe the universe has already shown itself to be, we can confidently conclude that no such catastrophes will arise up to the combined energy and collision total threshold that has already taken place within our observable universe. Only if we begin to collide particles at energies around 10 to the power of 20 EV or greater, a factor of 10 million greater than the present energy frontier, will we need to begin to worry about such events. That would require an accelerator significantly larger than the entire planet, and therefore, we can reach the conclusion that no, particle physics on Earth won't ever destroy the universe. That's also why there are many plans for building a new, next-generation particle collider to succeed the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, as many physicists hope to answer questions that the LHC is incapable of answering. For instance, is this truly the standard model Higgs boson that we've discovered, or are there other particles with the same quantum numbers as the standard model Higgs that mix together with it? When a newly created Higgs boson then decays, does it purely follow the standard model's predicted decay channels, or does it, at least sometimes, decay in a non-standard, unexpected way? When any of the heavy, exotic particles are created and then decay, do they show any evidence for non-standard behavior? And are there any new, exotic particles that can be created at a collider that fall outside of what the standard model predicts? All colliders have limits to what they'll be able to probe, even the HLLHC. To find out more information about the fundamentals of our universe, a new collider will be needed. And now, the four main options for doing so are a linear electron-positron collider like SLAC was back in the 1970s and 1980s. A circular electron-positron collider like LEP was through 2002, the predecessor to the LHC. 
a circular hadron-hadron collider like the LHC is today, or a circular moon-antimoon collider, which is a novel type of collider that has never been built. For good reasons, no one is considering building a circular proton-antiproton collider like Fermilab's Tevatron was until it was decommissioned in 2011. The tiny amount of extra energy you get from quark-antiquark -quark collisions versus quark-quark collisions is negligible at high energies, as most of the colliding particles are actually gluon-gluon collision at those energies, whereas you can increase your collision rates and luminosities by factors of many thousands or more by using protons instead of antiprotons. And end paper, a muon collider looks like the most brilliant option of all, as new generations of physicists get understandably excited about this possibility every 10-15 years or so. Moons and anti-moons are also leptons, like electrons and positrons, but 206 times heavier. As a result, they accelerate and gain energy like electrons, emit much less synchrotron radiation in a circular collider than electrons and positrons do, by a factor that scales as di 1206.4 collide in clean, perfectly annihilating collisions with their antiparticle, and allow 100% of their energy to be available for particle creation via Einstein's E equals mc squared. Using the same tunnel that a circular electron-positron collider would use, you could achieve energies that were hundreds of times as great using muons and antimuons instead. There is a big drawback, unfortunately, that simply can't be ignored. Even though it's fairly easy to create muons, the sad reality is that muons are unstable and decay relatively quickly. With a mean lifetime of just 2.2 microseconds, even special relativity accelerating these moons and antimunes close to the speed of light and extending their life through relativistic time dilation can't prevent the overwhelming majority of muons from uselessly and damagingly decaying away. Making muons is easy. You collide a beam of low-energy protons into a fixed target. The overwhelming majority of the particles that come out in a shower will be charged pions and those charged pions will then swiftly decay into muons and antimuons. But then the clock starts ticking. You have only a few microseconds in the muons' rest frame to collimate them, accelerate them, circulate them, and collide them with their antiparticle counterparts at the critical collision point. Miss your window, and your muon will decay into an electron, and that decay product will smash into your accelerator's wall where damage will cumulatively add up over time. Which type of collider, then, should we build next? The answer absolutely isn't none of them, as there is an enormous science case in favor of probing the physics of heavy, short-lived particles in the search for new phenomena. But which path turns out to be the smartest and most cost-effective is entirely dependent on which technological avenue advances the fastest, if it's energy gain per meter, we should build a linear electron-positron collider. If it's in muon survival technology, a muon collider would be revolutionary. And if it's in tunnel building and or bending magnet technology, a next generation circular collider could outclass them all. All of these paths face challenges, politically, economically, and technologically but they all point the way forward for directly exploring the frontiers of fundamental physics. At present, the smartest move might be to technologically research all of these options and for the field to go all in on the most promising one. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.